Hello, everybody. Uh, so first off, I just want to uh, thank everybody so much for attending, and thanks to the sponsors. Um, uh, my name is Michael. You can uh, take pictures of this talk. You can tweet about it. There's a hashtag, CommonWL. I think we, sometimes we use CommonWLJP for Japan as well. And uh, all the slides are online. And I'm sure that, that URL will get sent out as well uh, and tweeted here in a second. Um, so let's, uh, I just want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, as Tasho said, uh, I'm originally from the USA, from Arizona, uh, which is, uh, I guess Phoenix is not too far from the equator as compared to Tokyo. So I've been really enjoying the, the length of the days are much similar as to what I grew up in, even though it's much wetter here. Um, <laughs> My background is both in computer science and as a software engineer and a system administrator. Uh, and then I got a degree in microbiology, um, kind of a, a fun combination. And I, I got started in bioinformatics via just real, got thrown in, in into genome assembly of lizards um, at Arizona State, and then went to Michigan, also known as almost Canada, uh, where I worked for Titus Brown on the CageMar project. Um, as the lead software developer. Uh, so here's, a, here's the, the Northern Europe, here's the, the British Isles, you know, United Kingdom, uh, our friends uh, you know, Norway, and uh, Sweden and Finland. And here's the Baltics, just in case you didn't know. I didn't know any of the just geography until I moved to this part of the world. So there's uh, Estonia, Latvia, and then this is Lithuania, and a little bit of Russia, uh, Poland, Belarus. So I live here at the capital in Vilnius uh, for two years now. Um, and so uh, living in Europe has been really useful for me personally and for the project. Um, so I've been collaborating a lot with Elixir, which is this pan-European bioinformatics network, um, and the European Open Science Cloud pilot, so that they're launching a, a uh, unified uh, way of tracking and funding um, and governing these uh, cloud resources for open science across all disciplines in, in Europe. Uh, but I still keep my friendships and work with the United States. So I've been uh, assisting my friends who are working on the NH data comments. I think more will happen. Uh, there's, there's definitely lots of CWL there. More will happen with that in the future. Um, so uh, who here hasn't seen this video? Has anybody not seen this video? We had it on a loop at the beginning. One, one, well, okay, we will try this. Let's see. Uh, oh no, it just it just isn't going to work. So we'll show it again. We'll show it again later. But try, maybe it should pop out to make that video work. So I think that's uh, it's a good. Let me see if I can just make it. We'll make it work. When we first made this video, it was really important to me that it was uh, useful for folks all over the world. And um, so some of the people in this room helped translate it uh, and subtitle it into Japanese. So let's uh, we'll load this up, bring this over. And This is good quality. So, in many scientific fields such as bioinformatics, medical imaging, and astronomy, large quantities of data need to be analyzed. This can involve large-scale and repetitive processes in long pipelines of different tools referred to as workflows. It can be very time-consuming to run data for all these different tools by hand and convert outputs to various formats to make them compatible with the next step. Workflow management systems are designed to alleviate this problem by allowing these workflows to be expressed formally and providing infrastructure to set up, execute, and monitor them. This formal expression of workflows allows for scientists to easily share and reuse them. Crucially, they can also be used to verify results of computation for published work. However, there are many competing standards for describing workflows, which is a barrier to this aim. Currently, there are over 100 different data analysis workflow systems, with no interoperability between them. The need has arisen to have a single common standard, and so the Common Workflow Language project was created. 
an open standard designed to express workflows and their tooling in groups of YAML structured text files. So that was super fast. The good news is, is uh, we will go into that in more detail. So don't worry. So let me go back to the talk here. So uh, let's explain some terms here. We, we use this word workflow. We, we hear that word in different contexts. Um, some people know, may know business process management or business process workflows, like getting reimbursement for travel from our company or university. That's a business process. Uh, we don't mean that. Today we're talking about data analysis workflows, so stuff we use in science, uh, typically, sometimes referred to as batch processing. So CWL, the common workflow language, is a standard developed by the community to describe uh, tools and then workflows made from them. So how do we run this tool? How do we put stuff in? How do we get things out? And then how do we connect these tools up to make a workflow? It's a declarative standard. So it means we describe what we're doing, um, whereas some approaches uh, to talking about workflows are more um, programmatic. Um, so here we're describing what's happening. This gives us a lot of power. Um, CWL is not a product you purchase. It's not something you install. You use systems that know how to speak CWL. Um, so just it's a standards effort. Sometimes people say, you know, I'm going to get CWL. And you, hopefully you'll find something that works with CWL. We provide with CWL a formal schema in addition to a written thing that you can view as a human being. Um, so the specification. And then there's an extensive test suite, which we're going to hear more about later today. And from an IT perspective, in designing this language, luckily so many people came in from many different backgrounds, we were able to design something that works for both these so-called shared nothing clusters, where each local node has a different file system, class grid computing, where you've got that common file system across it, cloud environments, where maybe you have an object store or not, and just local single site execution. So a CDOL workflow, especially if it's got some software containers along with it, can run in all of these environments. So it's a um, built-in portability. Now portability and reproducibility is not guaranteed, but we do everything we can to make it quite possible and, and easier to do. Um, I think maybe many people, it's 2018, it's almost 2018, many people have heard of software containers and Docker. If you haven't, I'm happy to talk about that too. And CWL supports that absolutely, but also doesn't require it. So as you're getting to use CWL, you can start with locally installed software, uh, software available um, upon other ways, and then move into using software containers. Um, and I'll talk more about later about container formats. Um, so sometimes they need to motivate, like, why do standards? Um, different, different communities, different cultures have different feelings about standards. Sometimes standards can get in the way and not be a good thing. Uh, they, uh, but I believe a good standard can uh, uh, promote innovation, promote new things, lower costs. But I also believe that the, it's a marketplace of ideas. So we shouldn't be forced to use standards. They should be available. And if they fit our needs, then we should use them. So I, I hope many people in this room find CWL useful. But the re big reason why we need to have a standard is researchers just use different systems. They collaborate with different groups of people, even in a big institute. Even in the same building, people have different approaches to running and describing the workflows, um, and just over time. So you, we need a way to preserve this, to share these things. It really enables uh, collaboration. Um, and then we also know that funders and journals and other policy setters prefer a standard over a proprietary or single source solution. So it's good. Um, so just a little bit of timeline about the project. Um, back in 2014, uh, CWL was uh, launched as a, some four software engineers and whiteboard um, at, a, at a code fest, so like a hackathon. And the next year, we released draft two, and one of the commercial vendors uh, released their product based upon that in December, <coughs> Southern Bridges Genomics. Um, and in 2016, CWL 1.0.0 was released, and in 2017, we further refined that. Now that we had more implementations, we're able to clarify a lot of details. 
Uh, this year, you know, the really big news is IBM releasing an impl implementation of their own that they wrote. Their implementation is open source, but it requires IBM's uh, LSF scheduler, which is proprietary. Uh, so that works for a lot of people. Um, it's not not quite up to 1.0. It's very close, so we're helping them fix out all those little details right now. But a lot of their cust uh, some big customers are pushing that happen. And then CDBuild 1.1 is coming. I don't think I'm gonna get it done this month. So uh, soon, <laughs> so, we'll see, maybe next week will be very productive, we'll see. Um, and that includes uh, a lot of, from feedback of some people in this room have been very extremely helpful with this. Very, thank you, thank you, thank you. Seedwell um, has been featured in the NIH Data Commons and the European Open Science Cloud. So um, these regional, continental scale uh, collaborative efforts have, uh, have come to, to appreciate uh, the use of a, a mature standard. So I'm gonna go into a little bit of technical detail, uh, not super deep, we'll get more detail later in the Japanese section, but just like how do we think about tools, what, you know, what is our unit of computing? So for CWL, the core unit, what we do is a command line program. So something I type up on the terminal and run. So if you run it on a command line, so that it can be something written in Java, in R, in C++, and anything, basically, then you can have it as a component in a CWL workflow. Uh, so sometimes we have to be a little creative. Maybe, maybe we want to call a web service or request something from a database, which is a little tricky in a workflow, but you know, that can be done as well. Maybe we need to interact with a graphical program. Well, then we might need to fi find something else to help us interact with that graphical program. But most anything we can do in computers, we can definitely do in command line. So we take these command line programs and we turn them into well-typed functions. We give names to all the inputs and all the outputs. We figure out the type. It could be a number, a file, some sort of complex thing. Uh, hopefully, we also identify the file format. Um, and then, so this whole thing, these functions, and then we link these functions up, as I said, into these so-called so data flow style workflows. And I'll show some pictures here in a bit. So I set up here, it's like a POSIX command line tool, so like Linux or Unix. Now the CWL reference reader does run on Microsoft Windows because of Docker software containers. Linux software containers can run on Windows, so you, you can run and create these things in Windows as well. But the components themselves need to be these kind of Unix style command line tools. So, Another sort of benefit of how we model the world and this declarative format is not only do we describe what goes in, what goes out, we can also describe what sort of resources this tool needs. This helps us like save time and money because we make sure we run the job. Maybe we're using a commercial cloud provider or just our own local resources. And we can make sure we don't put the small job on the big machine. That might be not a good use. And we don't try to run the big job on the small machine where it'll just fail. So um, and you can learn more, learn more about that at this link, or uh, maybe later today we'll see some of this. So that includes number of CPU cores, the memory and storage, and in 1.1 they'll also include an estimate, if you can make it, an estimate of how long it might take for those of us who have time-based scheduling, where we need to know that, that wall time. If anybody has to deal with telling PBS the wall time of what we expect to run. Another feature of the model of how data, uh, CWL thinks about the world is, um, you know, we don't allow you to say, oh, this string, it, it happens to be a path. We really want to know where the data is. It's a file, it's a directory. But in the workflow itself, we don't really think about a specific location. So this is where we get that flexibility of running on different platforms. Um, so us, data has an identifier, and it's up to the platform to do something smart with that identifier. So maybe my identifier is from, um, uh, DB gap. Maybe it's from ENA or NCBI or uh, uh, DPG. Sorry, I always get the name wrong. DPG. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, so maybe I'm I'm referring to this identifier, and if the platform has a copy of that already, they'll do a smart thing and not download it again. Or it's protected data. It'll go run the computing at that site. So I'm not saying platforms have this capability. Some do, some don't, but they can. The model supports this data locality. Uh, and this also helps with the resource matchmaking. So I want to talk a little bit about how we make CWL and how I try to run it as the community. Um, 
is that it's this community-based standards development. So it's not like ISO style or IEEE, -E -E, IEEE. Um, it is a very open and transparent way of doing standards, very collaborative. Uh, we still have costs, we, um, but it is always free to participate, free to use, and free to implement. And that will never change. So I, just, I, think, I think these sort of values matter. I mentioned software containers earlier, and some people say, uh, you know, I hear Docker is fine, but my system administrators refuse to run it on our cluster. They don't think it's secure. Uh, some people may know about this singularity alternative to Docker. Uh, some people may have some problems with it because that's now run by a single for-profit company. So there's a lot going on in the software container space. One thing I'd like to tell folks about um, is that there's uDocker. So just the letter U in Docker, and it, it's a way of running not every Docker container, but probably the Docker containers we're making today. So just as a reminder, software container is like a, it's a virtualization approach. You can run on any, any Linux system without any special permissions. So if there's no system administrators in the room, you don't have to ask your admin for permission. You don't need root. It just works. Maybe it's not as fast as Singularity or Docker, but it works. So there's no excuses for not using software containers. Um, and CWL supports all of these. So we, we say that the container format itself is in the Docker format, but you don't have to use the Docker software, the Docker engine, right? Because Singularity can run a Docker container. New Docker obviously supports a Docker container. But these are optional. Um, so mentioning the, the various open source implementations, there is a reference runner. It works, um, but it's not meant to be production strong. Uh, it's where we experiment and try things out. Um, a company called Curiverse, which is now owned by Veritas Genetics, has this uh, Arvedo system. It's a full platform for running workflows. I mentioned IBM CW Exec, uh, which is more of a workflow executor. It's not really a platform yet. Uh, Airflow, there's a plugin for CWL from this team based in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and uh, Toil CWL Runner, which actually began at the Biohackathon three years ago, um, has CWL support. That's quite popular with people um, who are running you know, PBS, Torx, Lerm, uh, these, and also LSF. The great computing people quite enjoy this, but also works with Amazon. Uh, Ravix Bunny um, is kind of on hold for a moment. Uh, it's open source side, but the commercial side from Seven Bridges exists. And then there's this Rihanna one um, from CERN that's uh, Kubernetes based. Um, and there's, there's more, but these are kind of some of the, the bigger well-known ones. Uh, so I've mentioned this, the different, some of the details I already did with the different backends. Um, I just want to say there's lots of editors and viewers and actually plugins also written by many people, some people in this room. So thank you for that. So uh, you don't have to choose between Vim and Emacs or Visual Studio. We have CWL support for all of them. It's quite exciting. Uh, okay, let's actually see a workflow. Here's a project I did for the European Bioinformatics Institute taking a metagenomics workflow. So the original one was almost so 9,500 9, is almost 10,000 lines of Python, Bash, and Perl code. Not to do the research, just to run it. So there's none of this is analysis code, this is running some of the analysis, analysis code. So it was converted into 2,500 lines of CWL description, which means we can visualize it, we can document it, we can improve it, and it can run on multiple systems. Um, so here's just some slides. My co-founders are from uh, Peter Upstead from Curvers, John Chilton from the Galaxy Project, and Boisha Chijanik uh, from Seven Bridges. And among the way we've been working with folks all over the world. You'll see a lot of life sciences on this slide. I hear there's some, some not life sciences. Here's uh, the Elixir network. Um, but we're also seeing CBL usage in uh, the Netherlands across all fields, like also including digital humanities and hydrology, in radio astronomy, uh, and then now in a bit into high energy physics. So uh, I'm going to go over time a little bit just to talk about extensibility uh, is a core part of how CWL works. So again, this is where we don't want the standard to get in the way of doing new things. So uh, for example, this uh, vendor-specific feature 
is actually going to become part of Cedarville 1.1 because we let the vendor go figure out this was a good idea and what's going to be a good syntax, and then now that's going to make it into the spec. Um, in the future, oh, about the containers, in the future we will support this open container initiative, so we like other standards. Um, I think I'm about done. I, you know, I have some use cases we can talk about. I think that's a good introduction. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see the floor and we can go on to the next talk. So uh, we'll skip all the technical details for later. Oh, here's that. Here's the key points, right? This declarative standard allows the researcher to focus on their work, right? What is the science they're doing? How are they using these programs? That's complicated enough. We want the researcher and the scientist to focus on that. We want our operations people and our sysadmins and our platform developers to focus on efficient, secure, uh, co you know, cost benefit. Uh, and so this separation of concerns is the core to what CWL is and having this ecosystem of things that help each other out. So thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to talking and sharing more with the rest of the day.